Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this December edition of the, the Air Community Meeting. Um, today, we, we have a, a couple of topics, um, sort of like starting off with, you know, a presentation or discussion on like uh, Erie and, and OpenX Lay and, you know, like the, the collaboration plan there and, you know, just how everything fits together, uh, which I think has been on a couple of folks' minds. Um, and thereafter, we have uh, Ben, uh, you know, Open and, and Matt talking a little bit about the the work that folks may have noticed that's ongoing with respect to distributed execution and collectives uh, in Erie. Uh, so, you know, you know, very excited to hear a bit more there from folks. Um, but I'll sort of start off handing it over to uh, Stella and or Tia. I'm not sure who, who will be speaking. Oh, we didn't we didn't coordinate on this. Uh... Taya, do you want do you want to speak or do you want me to speak? My computer is being a little funky, so why don't you start and then <laughs> why don't you start and then I'll fill in. Okay. <clears throat> well, hey folks, uh, this is this is Taya. Uh, she she runs the OpenXLA community. Um, and that's a good lead into what we're gonna talk about. Um, we've been working behind the scenes for for a while to um, to align these these two two projects, you know, we've been uh, been in the same org and, and, you know, same part of the company working in, uh, in on similar things. And, uh, and it's just taken a taken a bit of time to decide what we want to do with the brand. And especially with uh, Erie having come a lot from the um, from more of the deployment client side and open XLA coming from the server side. Uh, we've decided these are really complementary, and we want to we want to pull in the, pull them together and, and invest together. So um, I don't actually have a solid plan on on how this is going to work out, but um, you know, in the I I like to say that uh, I was in Denver in the um, uh, when uh, Quest bought US West, and um, I remember that when they made the announcement, they just dropped a big Q over the US. They had a couple of guys on the on the roof. And, uh, and that was how they announced that, that the merger was happening. So um, in similar vein, uh, you know, more of an intent, uh, Erie's going to be joining the OpenXLA community and, and brand. And, um, <clears throat> you know, practically what that what that means over time, you know, repo organizations and whatnot will, will get worked out and, and you know, which, which organization holds it. Uh, probably the biggest thing is that I've been working with Taya on for many months is the um, OpenXLA uh, governance and um, uh, community standards and how we do do outreach and how we collaborate and all that stuff. And um, I'll say that Erie's Erie's outreach style is very grassroots, and um, OpenXLA's is is uh, that what we're trying to build is is something that we can sustain um, as as a you know a, a more of a foundation level thing that that can go forward for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to to uh, combining forces on that because it feels like it's the time that uh, that Erie graduates a bit in terms of of how we do um, how we how we do community management governance you know work amongst ourselves and all that stuff and and it it was just uh, not making any sense for us to do that in, in two silos so um, that's that's basically the uh, what what we know right now I'll hand it over to Taya. Yeah, um, I'm in the middle of finalizing like a first proposal for for governance um, for the Open XLA project, and hope hope to publish that um, this week uh, for feedback from the community. So we'll definitely um, include the Erie community and some of that feedback. I think, um, but essentially, what we're trying to build is you know a good hybrid between kind of hierarchical um, governance that makes it very easy to scale, very easy to understand like where um, different groups technical scopes for decision making are. So to kind of avoid a lot of stepping on toes and gray areas for who actually can make decisions. Um, but at the same time, um, definitely decentralize um, the, the decision making as much as possible and kind of, you know, relying on the different um, Kind of subgroups that are most actively working on the code um, to to largely manage all the decisions themselves um, without feeling like you know they're easily blocked. So we're kind of trying to um, 
have a very clear decision making structure, but then also as much as possible defer to to code owners in terms of you know how they decide to um, you know design their specific areas and and only having kind of that hierarchical structure to deal with escalations where the the maintainers themselves are like, hey, we need help figuring out what what we sh what decision we should make. Um, so from like a governance perspective, I feel pretty happy with where we've gotten. Um, some of our basic principles are are that like, you know, we're seeking to make consensus based decisions. Um, also that, you know, people's responsibility in the project are largely tied to their technical um, contributions for technically scoped areas. And then we're also figuring out how to um, also uh, open up project responsibilities for people who are making lots of non-technical contributions as well um, and where that fits in. Um, as far as like active collaboration and, and cross coordination between the groups, like are we doing this largely on Discord? Are we trying to set up um, a discourse forum? Are we trying to, are we going to be driving this through like mailing lists and RFCs? I think that is something that we're still kind of trying to build and figure out. Um, and I feel like the Erie community, um, we have a lot to learn in the OpenXLA um, community from like how the Erie community manages like, you know, kind of that tight feedback cycle of collaboration, which, which I think, you know, could use more structure as far as a governance model perspective, but also I think you know, as much as we can borrow from from you know the kind of more grassroots style of active col uh, collaboration, the better. So I think that that's probably something we'll dig into a little bit more in Jan, um, and would love your your feedback on that. Just like how do we work most effectively together um, across ninety percent of it. Teams. Ninety percent of it is cat pictures. Um, and, and dog pictures. We don't we, we don't discriminate. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. And you know, I'll, I'll also mention that uh, that a lot of the um, the you know corporate entities that I work with are have been asking for this for for some time. You know, the grassroots is great, but um, but you know, actually growing this up a level and having having a roadmap that that gets us to uh, to kind of um, a neutral governance and perpetuity is 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 what people uh people want if they're if they're investing a lot of resources so you know i see this as a as um uh, you know there were a few paths forward to get to get there and um and this this is the one that that made a lot of sense and and uh, in, in terms of addressing that feedback any thoughts or questions on the exciting topic of of governance Okay, well, let's uh, the technical part of the conversation. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so I think oh, okay. that that's actually like a right. little bit for the for the more technical side of the discussion. <laughs> um, we'll see the tag team feedback. All right, so let me prepare this slide. I mean, I was going to ask if the governance council will be blue or red, but I think that discussion, you know, we, we can defer also. So. All right. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Okwan, and uh, our team is working on the, the SPMD and uh, scaling. Uh, to support uh, distributed computing uh, through the Erie stack, so uh, it's uh, it's in the early stage. So, uh, uh, but so uh, I want to talk about the progress so far. So, okay. So yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it's very clear. We need to uh, scale up uh, the the compiler and runtime. Uh, to support uh, uh, large models. So we need to uh, scale up for latency. And also we need to uh, scale up for the data size. Uh, uh, traditionally, it's mostly uh, about the training. But uh, these days uh, we are seeing more heavy inference 
uh, workload for uh, uh, some models, uh, which take uh, more than a second. So normally, inference side uh, wants to have a, a latency less than like a few tens of microsecond, right? And and so, uh, uh, so this work is a work, work in progress, and uh, there are many parts to finalize for the whole step. So. Uh, let me introduce the, the eerie step. Uh, uh, and we have an input source, and uh, we have a flow IR, stream IR, and har IR. And also, we have a VM instructions, and those VM uh, uh, instructions uh, call the driver runtime APIs for each target. So, this is a recap about the ED compiler stack. And this is the uh, progress we are making in the early stack. So we want to uh, target the, uh, uh, we want to you know, support JAX PMAP uh, uh, for the initial uh, outcome. And uh, we, uh, Ben uh, uh, already uh, added the support for the stream hard VM and also uh, driver uh, APIs. And I, I'm working on the nickel side and the, the other uh, parts. So uh, I'm, uh, so we are currently targeting at the NVIDIA devices. Uh, and we want to use the nickel communication API from NVIDIA, uh, which is open source. So we can, we can uh, easily modify and deploy in our setup. So that's very nice. And nickel, uh, NVIDIA made a nickel uh, library because the, they have a very fast uh, direct communication uh, among the GPU, even across the distributed. Uh, so I want to give you a, 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 a brief uh, changes in the uh, IR steps. So uh, it, as I mentioned, we have a stream, hard VM, and driver and API changes, but there are missing part, uh, which is this the, uh, between the front end and the stream IR. So we are still uh, in, uh, uh, surveying the, the the what would be the best IR for for this layer. So in the in the uh, you know the normal uh, distributed computing. API, API is, normally has a communicator and uh, uh, information about the uh, current process ID, sometimes called the rank, and the total number of uh, processes. Uh, so in this case, uh, in, in, in the Steam IR, uh, we have a, a operation to create the channel. And also, uh, we, can, uh, we have a API to query the rank and the count, uh, which is given by the environment or command line. And so we have an API to create the channel. Uh, we, we also have an API to create the default channel. And there is a, a, also a, the collective communication app. So then they, this, this, uh, in, in the middle, we have a stream async collective app, and which is lowered into the stream command ex ex Executed, sorry, and uh, you know during the uh, uh, progressive lowering, the stream up is lowered into HAR and the HAR is lowered to VM. So I, I will show the HAR ops here. So the theme is the uh, same, right? We have a rank and count information, and we have a channel uh, a value, and we we have a comment of, uh, about the collective operation. So, so in the in the VM, yeah, fi uh, the, into the VM, we, we have the same information channel and rank and count, and uh, the, eventually we have a high command buffer collective operation. So, so in in the runtime, uh, so, sorry about the small fonts, and uh, uh, in the runtime, uh, we we have a corresponding data structures, right? So we have a high channel uh, uh, data structure, and uh, we have a, a, a related uh, APIs 
like a channel create and query rank and count. Uh, then the, this API, the high level API is connected to the uh, each target's uh, driver API. In the CUDA runtime, we have uh, this uh, nickel channel create function, and which eventually calls the nickel com in rank com config, uh, which creates the nickel communicator. And, and we also have a, a submit batch command, and then that, that eventually calls the nickel function, communicator function, uh, based on the op kind in the batch entry. So that's the overview about, about the uh, compiler step. So uh, as you can see, uh, the communication API it is pretty much like orthogonal from the existing compiler step. So just adding a few uh, uh, support for the channels and operation, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we are pretty much ready in the, in the compiler step to support the distributed computing. Uh, so here is the uh, nickel functions exposed to the uh, exposed as a dynamic library function call, and here I added uh, two uh, URI specific uh, API functions uh, in line three and four. So nickel init uh, root, uh, which actually initiates the server role for the root process and uh, nickel get unique ID from the environment. So this is uh, to specify the server address. And uh, uh, this is to walk around, uh, uh, walk around not using the MPI communication to broadcast uh, the server ID from the root process to the other uh, processes. So uh, with the help of these two uh, API functions, uh, we can directly use the nickel function without the initial uh, uh, MPI put the striping. Yeah, the, the important thing there being that um, Erie as a library doesn't actually own the context of the application or how you would set up an application or a framework to, to layer these things. So the kind of things that traditionally are done with kind of broadcast and stuff like that um, are something that whatever is integrating Erie uh, would provide. So that might be something like PJRT on the JAX side as it it handles distribution and launching sharded processes and stuff like that. Um, and Erie as as the library will basically just take that and use use whatever the higher layer layer does. So should should integrate well with any existing application that is already using collectives um, or already has a a communication mechanism uh, between its its shards. Yeah, thanks for the information. Yeah. Uh... So uh, yeah, we want to make the Erie uh, stack uh, as flexible as possible. They can be called uh, uh, in uh, various situations. Uh, so our, our, our plan is uh, to, to uh, so this is a very like uh, immature stage, but uh, we have a kind of uh, 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 where establish the setup right now. So we want to do the full test from the stream up uh, to the runtime call, and we want to verify all the communications. And uh, also, as I mentioned, there is a, uh, uh, some IR design and this uh, uh, decision needed uh, between the front end and the stream up. So we want to, there is a CCL uh, effort to to make the uh, communicate collective communication support in the IMRIR. and uh, we want to survey more options to support the various languages and uh, to represent uh, as generic as possible. So uh, also uh, uh, we are trying to integrate this this step with JAX uh, as an initial stage and. Uh, and also, we want to support large uh, models with the GPU cluster, and and you know the the the, the major challenge in the distributed computing is uh, how we they, how we do data partitioning, and generate uh, communication. Actually, the communication cost is the the most expensive uh, one in the distributed applications. 
So data partitioning and communication optimization is the key part of the, uh, the, the optimization uh, process. So uh, there are several uh, uh, options we have. So TensorFlow already has GSPMD stuff, so we, we can explore it more. And there are some other open source uh, project uh, uh, that tries to do the automatic data partitioning and communication optimization. And so uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be our next survey, uh, what would be, would be the best choice for the uh, best performance. And so we are currently targeting a, a single device per uh, process, but uh, there may be some uh, cases where the performance uh, might be better uh, with the multi-device in a single host. So that, 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 can, uh, that can be uh, also supported by our UD runtime stack. Uh, and currently we are uh, targeting at the NVIDIA devices, but uh, the, as you can see from the step, the, the communication library actually uh, is is well abstracted uh, under the, uh, the uh, driver runtime side. So we can, we can easily adapt the other communication libraries like MPI or some other, uh, uh, other communication APIs. So uh, also we can, we, can, we can support the other uh, the, uh, targets like CPU and you know, some, some other accelerators. So uh, uh, that's it. And uh, any questions? I, I could probably, if anyone's interested, talk a, a little bit more about the big missing layer that was was on one of the, the earlier sheets at kind of the, the flow level. Um, there's there's interest in that. I mean, I'd be interested. Uh, OK. so. So one one of the goals with with all of this, as as we've been kind of going through, is to connect to the existing libraries that we have. Nickel being one of them. Intel has a, a library that does does CCL stuff, um, MPI, etc. Um, and so be, being able to target those effectively for what you want to use them for, which is mostly the the distribution and memory system benefits. Um, whether you're on a single device and you've got multiple NUMA nodes and you're using a memory controller to perform the operations or multiple GPUs and you're allowing, you know, peering to, to take care of this on the same device. Um, but there's also additional levels of this that, that haven't really been explored um, in a lot of cases outside of very specific scenarios for things like halide on a particular device. Um, but where even on a single device, you can still get benefits from collective operations. Uh, and by modeling them as collective operations. And so a uh, kind of classic example of that is things like vertical tiling and where you might want to take a single stack of a very you know, non-parallelizable model. You've got data dependencies between each layer um, and partition each of those layers into, uh, you know, like say four uh, and do that down the entire stack. And if you can do that, then you now create instead of one, you know, end to end latency bound, uh, you now have four times one fourth latency bounds. And if you can run those out of sync, even even a slight bit, uh, you can cover for uh, latency on the GPU or on the CPU. So a, a lot of the benefits that that we talk about, you know, usually when, when people talk about collectives are on the distribution scale, um, but this also applies to running on single devices on, on single hosts. And so one of, one of the goals with all of this was to get to a model such that we could both uh, use the kind of classic APIs like Nickel and things like that, um, as well as within a single device, um, get all the same benefits. And where that intersects then with what our representation is at the, the higher levels is we want to be able to optimize just like we do with, with the other dispatch workloads we do. Um, so examples of that would be, uh, you know, if, if there, there's no magic with collectives that make it go faster than the speed of light. And so if you're doing a collective, you know, reduce across, you know, 10 gigabytes of data across 100 machines, um, all, all those bits need to move. Uh, and so one of the things we can do as a compiler when we can optimize is do things like pull out additional levels of that. So, for example, instead of doing a 10 gigabyte reduction across a bunch of machines, 
if we could locally on each machine do a one gigabyte reduction uh, and then do, you know, a hundred kilobyte reduction across machines, um, you know, that, that makes things a lot better. So a, a lot of what we really want to be able to model at the flow level is the same kind of fusion opportunities, the, the peeling opportunities, um, tiered reductions and things like that. Uh, and we need something a little bit more flexible than a front end already coming in with collectives as stateful in place allocated operations. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't also support that. So if you're coming in from a front end where the user has explicitly typed out, you know, send or receive or something like that, um, we, we can tunnel those through. Um, but really, we as we're plumbing this through the entirety of the Erie stack, we really are thinking about what does it mean when Erie itself is producing the collective operations? Um, again, even if you're on a single machine and a single GPU, um, we, we may still produce these collective operations. Um, how do we how do we optimize those when we're talking about lineage operations where we might be peeling off some of these collective operations um, into things like lineage generics with reductions that we're then fusing with with producer operations um, or consumers. Um, and yeah, so as as Aquan mentions, there's there's quite a few ways to model that stuff. And I think because a, a lot of this has kind of only been done in in distributed situations, there hasn't been too much. Um, prior work here that we we can kind of crib for for some of this. Um, the the next step will be getting the front end, like Jax, for example, has already written written out and decided how to shard this. Um, but our eye is really on the future where, where we'll be doing this ourselves. Um, and then on the runtime side, as as Aquan mentioned, we have have the nickel nickel side right now. Um, that the the channel is. A virtual interface and so we will have nickel because that is for for anyone using nvidia devices pretty much what you want to use if if you actually um, want to get good performance there so we'll, we'll have that but um it is a, a virtual interface and so there can be alternative implementations if someone already has some collective mechanism you know you're in a data center and you've you've got your own memory subsystem that you're you're targeting with your collectives um we can plug in there uh an example of that would be uh Lib fabric and what that's used for, uh, kind of as a pluggable interface for transports for collectives and things like that. Um, the goal being that we will eventually be able to allow you to plug in these different collective channel implementations across the different backends, whether you're using CUDA or Vulkan or CPU, um, you'll be able to plug in kind of kind of whatever you want there. Um, and then I think the final thing was the the thing that we're currently missing near the front end is the send and receive. Um, specifically, uh, those collective operations have some implications around what a compiler is actually able to do because they're side affecting and they're kind of materializing um, tensors out of thin air. Um, so there's still some design work to be done there. There's there's nothing today at the flow level that allows us to model model those kind of kind of operations. Um, so the initial set of collectives that we support are exclusively the structured collectives like reduce scatter and gather and, and things like that, um, which is in most cases an, enough for, for the basic basic JAX programs we're running. Um, if someone does have examples of good abstract collective operations in SSA form, um, that that would be super useful. Please, please reach out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think and if any any other questions. So uh yeah, uh Buyan. Uh so I have a question. So you mentioned that you wanna be able to initialize uh like the collective backend in some uh, like to, to to offload it to the application uh, the user of theory. So do you like because you 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 describe there uh, like very specific to nickel uh, initialization functions that bypass uh, the necessity of having another MPI library to bootstrap the initialization of nickel. So uh, do you? think there is like some way to do it uh, like some more general way where you don't target just nickel with this but uh, kind of I don't know like kind of 
so, some non-specific way to to be able to initialize the so when when the from from the programs that we emit from the compiler um there's there's kind of two two models depending on which front end you come from um one of them is for example in jax when it pre-shards the program and each each input the eerie compiler gets is an entire shard um and in that case, the Jax runtime is expected to have, you know, done the interchange of of the the um, IDs and stuff. Um, and so we'll we'll just take those in. The other way, though, is explicit channel creation. And so if your API and Jax has a mode for this, where it will produce one program that can kind of polymorphically act as any shard, um, and it can have multiple channels at any given time, so you can have, you know ranks zero through three in one channel and ranks four through eight in another and you know there could be overlap and stuff like that um and that's something that's programmatically controllable uh the i think maybe, maybe what what you're getting to there is who creates the channel um and i think that is is a front-end question so if you're using the default channel then we'll use whatever parameters you passed in when you created the device um but just as yeah, Eerie you know is... I mean, like, uh, when you create, the, I know that there is like in the runtime, uh, there is an option to pass like generic parameters, but they would be like, we, we want them to be like the same for trying to be the same for all backends. It might be like very specific to some uh, CCL backend, but... Uh, Correct. Like... And so the, the um, idea with that is Eerie is is a state like it produces stateful programs um and so just like you can add setters and getters for your model stateful variables for example um you can do the same with channels and so an application wanting to provide its own channels that it's configured in in a back end specific way um you know it can it can literally call what what you know the nickel example here was you know eerie how cuda nickel blah 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 create um you know, whatever concrete implementation you want, whatever parameters you want, whatever configuration you want, um, if you're wrapping an existing communicator that you already have in your application, um, application does that and then has a setter on the model that says set the channel to use. Um, and that channel is a, a variable within the model that is then then used. So we we can support the cases where the model itself, as it's compiled and then running at runtime, creates the channels or acquires the channels. Um, or the situations where users want to explicitly say, use this channel for communication. Um, and that that gives you that control of, you know, I, I, ha I outside of Erie entirely, have my own channels and communication mechanisms and, and things like that. Um, in Erie, I just want you to use this um, versus the, you know, nickel is built into the box if you're using the CUDA, CUDA driver and you can just get that for, for free. Hey, Ben. Um, is there maybe a missing, like, boil it down sample for some of this that might help? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of missing samples. For yeah, well, what, I, what I'm getting at is that this is at that really weird intersection where, you know, we're used to taking programs directly from front ends that are kind of operating in a much more monolithic fashion in the old world. Um, and, you know, we ultimately need, need who's generating the input to Erie to to adapt in order to be the, the best thing. Um, so I, I I just live at this intersection. I know how hard it is to talk across three different levels of, of, of the stack, especially when no one wants to touch the one that's named TensorFlow and all that stuff. <laughs> so yep. um, I, I'm just wondering if there's a, a simple, you know, or at least a hermetic example that says, hey, this is this is how Erie wants to use, wants to use collectives. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know the, the the this is kind of the classic problem of, of building a framework is we're enabling you to do anything but what everyone wants to do is is special and unique and so i think for I, this I, initial work we don't have anything running yet the nickel stuff yeah. isn't wired up we're not yet emitting the ops um so this this is still very early um as we get things working we'll have samples that show off some of the different usage my my hope is to go through the nickel getting started guide where they have like the three or four different ways to initialize a, a nickel channel um and basically have those equivalents in Erie uh and then if there are other frameworks we wire up we can we can do the same yeah so um 
yeah, I'll, I'll add one addendum to what you said. You know, we're making a framework that lets you do anything and people, people want that. But I think people also definitely like when the, like you, you got in and got your head joined around the whole thing and like, what's the recommendation, <laughs> you know, and then that'll be, uh, uh, copy pasted. Um, so I think that, uh, Doe had a question. Um, yeah, just, just really quickly on that. The hardest part about all of this, this collective stuff so far has been finding anything but hello world collective examples. So if you are a user who, who has feelings about collectives and has use cases and, and, and real stuff, please, please share them. Um, it'll, it'll help us ensure that we're getting the right samples and we've got the right API hooks and stuff. Um, it is, it is literally, literally impossible to find anyone actually using collectives in a, in an interesting way. So, um, very, very much appreciate that. It's, it's all very, very vertically integrated. So Doe had a question of, um, uh, I hear that Erie produces stateful programs. In my experience, input to Erie is not stateful. It's functions. Am I missing something? Um, so we do, uh, in, in some situations, we have built Erie in order to, the, the module is, is stateful. It's true that most, um, most ML frameworks are tracing out a single, a single entry function that is, is, is stateless. Um, but this is what we were just talking about, that uh, the input to Erie can, can declare globals, it can declare, uh, it can declare initializer functions, it can declare other things. And then within, within the functions that you're, uh, that you're actually evaluating, it can load those, use the channels, use the handles and, and, and put things together. The thing that I've, uh, this, you know, actually doing that in depth require, would require a lot of work at, at the, uh, the high level uh, of the framework. What I've done in the past, if you look at the Erie Jax project, is basically say, what can we do by wrapping a an otherwise framework generated stateless function with uh, with state? And that's that's kind of the direction. Um, uh, the direction is probably the most profitable for the near term. Is you know use use the frameworks to generate stateless functions and then augment the model and and. Uh, create a new wrapper function that delegates to that in 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 some way um but this this all requires this all requires front end work to to leverage uh completely yeah and we we do have a variables and state sample that's using the the tensorflow representation because tensorflow is one of the few that actually has variables um and so that that one at least if, if you're interested to see how state can be represented and then tunneled all the way through um, that, that's a good place to start. But like, like Stella said, the, the Jack stuff is probably, probably more interesting. But one, one thing too, is even if the input does not itself represent a stateful program, um, the Erie compiler through various stages will often generate state. And so, you know, whether, whether that's, you know, one time initialization of tensors that we hoist out and move into initializers and then store as stateful variables, um, or the rest of the program internals when we launch and we compile all the CUDA kernels or or Spear V shaders and things like that, um, we retain those in the program as as stateful handles. So, um, yeah, it's really really a question of what what kind of programs are we ingesting and how do you model those with state, um, and the rest kind of just is a program. You're welcome. Nice. Um, well, I mean, I, I think this is the, the, the time of the community meeting where, you know, it's, it's open for, for questions from folks from the community. Um, um, of course, you know, we'll, we'll have our, our next one uh, probably like middle of January, it's roughly a month from, it, from now. Uh, I'll also mention next week is the OpenXLA community meeting. Um, and so given what you just heard earlier, you know, we'll also be there to, to well, join that meeting. So uh you know uh, uh, to, to give a plug for that um but yeah so the, the floor is open if folks have any other questions i mean awesome with all that well explained that everybody that's just that's great um I, I think that just means we have more time for coffee uh or beer. Or beer. <laughs> this is true. Very times independent. Yes, that's, that's very true. 
Um, I just want to say thanks everybody for, for joining. Um, I'll send out the email again for our next meeting soon. Uh, please use the form as well to, to highlight topics of interest. Um, like you saw today, today was something work in progress that we're doing on. So just to give an idea of some of the things we're doing, uh, you know, and so, you know, it, it's great to hear from community with respect to specific interests. And yeah, see you again soon. Thanks for organizing, Jock. It's, it's, uh, but I, I really appreciate you actually being proactive about these community meetings. They're really easy to just blow by on topics and whatnot. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.